Hey, welcome to Snowmobiler Television. On this week's show, we're gonna start things off back in my shop where I'm changing the track on the old SCSI. Now, if you remember from just a couple of shows ago, we ran that thing on the ice for our radar run and the track started to come apart. So we're gonna change that out and once we've got that job done, we're gonna head back to the ice to run it again just to see how fast that thing would have been against those other triple sleds. Then later on in the show, Rich and I are gonna hit the trails on a couple of Polaris Matrix sleds, one 650 and one 850, to get a real handle on the differences between those two engines in the real world. So let's hit the start button on this show right now. Brought to you by Yamaha, revs your heart. Polaris, think outside. Ford F-Series, Canada's best-selling line of pickup trucks for 55 years. Tough, smart, capable. So back at the super secret White Lake of flat frozen awesomeness, I was in the middle of one of my practice radar runs when I heard a little funny noise coming out of the SCSI here and that turned out to be the track coming apart. Now by the position of the shrapnel that we picked up off the track, all of this happened at the quick end, which means if it really got any worse than it did, uh, that could have ended really badly for me. And when you think about it, if the track comes out of the back of your snowmobile, it takes your brakes with it. And given the speeds we were going on the track and the low snow and icy conditions we were on, I'm pretty sure if this track did exit at the back of the SCSI, it would have rode me right to the point of the wreck. Now, if you remember, I was kind of concerned about the condition of the track even before we brought this thing to the ice. I probably should have known better, but it's what I had. Now, speaking of what I had, you'll notice I have another track underneath the SCSI here. Back when I bought this sled, it came with another basket case backup sled. And wouldn't you know it? <laughs> there was a track in the pile of parts. Now this track isn't much better than the one that came apart, but I really didn't feel like spending six or $700 on a new one, which would have been like half of what I paid for the whole sled. Instead, this old ratty used one is not just good, but good enough. Now, as you can see, I've already started the process of changing the track here on the SCSI, which isn't really too bad on the CK3 chassis, despite having to take the whole chain case out to do the job. At this point, I've got to get the chain case cover back on and oil in there, the rear suspension back in, tighten up the track, and basically, that should only take a minute or two here in TV land. Um, looks like we're gonna need a montage. Replacing a track is one of the bigger jobs on the sled. It's not real complicated, but there's a lot of things that have to come apart and go back together again to make it happen. The trickiest bit is usually the chain case. With all its moving parts, there are shims and washers and gears that all have to go back in correctly to work, especially on setups with these old mechanical reversers. Just remember, it's only nuts and bolts. So the next part of this job is to get the rear suspension back in the sled over there. But like any time when you have your rear suspension out, it's the perfect opportunity to have a really good look at everything. Now before this goes back in, I'm gonna show you a couple of details you need to be looking for, plus a problem that I found on this thing. The number one thing to look for is these pivot shafts. They can seize up inside the different suspension arms. And when they do that, instead of rotating the way they should, it starts turning the bolts holding them to the suspension rails. This can loosen the bolts off, backing them right out, or make the threads act like a saw and they start cutting through the aluminum rail itself. If you can't get the Zerk fittings to take grease, it's a good indicator that the shaft is seized or getting close to it. Next, check for any bad bogey bearings, thin spots in the slides, and for any other broken or missing parts. So with the suspension on the bench with this inspection, I actually found something that I missed when it was in the SCSI. The shaft that goes across the bottom between the suspension rails that basically holds the front shock in place, the bolt was loose. And what it was doing was traveling up and down inside the aluminum and it actually chewed out a pretty big oblong hole there. Now to fix this properly, it should be welded and re-drilled. I don't have time for all that. So I made a little steel plate to catch the aluminum extrusion, put a new bolt in it, and I'm gonna send it. I 
I have to get the suspension back in the sled and with the help of another montage, this should go quickly. Ten mil, ten, oh. Ten mil's missing again. Now getting the suspension back in, inside the track is a little tricky because there's so many knobs and other stuff to get hung up on. Backing the rear axle off to make the suspension as short as possible helps. Now once inside, a little muscle or a tug with a ratchet strap can help pull things into position to bolt up the suspension arms. So with the sled pretty much back together, it's not quite ready to go to the lake just yet. And you see, here's where hindsight comes into play. Rich on that exquisite XCR ran 107 miles an hour down the ice. And honestly, even with that new track, I don't think the SCSI has it in it. So since we've been to the ice, I've gone to the interwebs and let my fingers do some shopping and well, had some more parts delivered to the shop that are going to um, optimize it a bit more. All right, so let's go through the list of goodies that I've got for the SCSI. First, Woody studs, because one thing all of those sleds suffered from out on the ice was grip. So we're gonna put another 96 studs in this on top of the 96 studs that are in there for 192 or so, because there's a bunch of broken ones, but that is really gonna do wonders to get this thing down the ice. Now, for what's in this box, knife. Here we've got packing materials. I got some bearings in case I needed them for the drive shaft, but I didn't. I've got some spindle bushings, but I'm not gonna put those in there just yet. Um, what I do have though is spark plugs. Lots of spark plugs, because that thing was eating them like candy. Um, let's see, I've also got uh, a primary clutch kit, which I'm gonna install some of. I got a secondary clutch kit because the buttons on that one are toast. And in case we needed it, I picked up a fuel filter. But the secret sauce to this whole thing is, ta-da, V-Force reeds. These things are gonna pump so much more air into that thing, and it's gonna propel that Mach-Z down the ice at better than 107 miles an hour. It better, anyways, it better. STV's pro tip of the day is brought to you by Yamaha. So here's a tip for whenever you're working on your rear suspension. And the tip is to have a cheap ratchet strap around. These things are perfect for doing jobs like pulling the front suspension down when you're trying to adjust your front limiter straps or when you're putting this into the chassis to help pull the pivot points in and out to line up the bolt holes on the chassis with the mounting points of the suspension. Trust me, this cheap tool will really save a lot of cursing and swearing. STV is brought to you by Motovan, for the love of power sports. So to begin my optimization of the SCSI, I'm gonna start with studs. Now, if there was an Achilles heel with all those other machines on the ice that day, it was their lack of grip on that really hard lake ice. And installing studs is definitely gonna add mile an hour to the Mach-Z because it's gonna be able to get going that much faster. Now, when it comes to installing studs, there's really no simple, easy way or trick to get around it. You just have to do it. I'm adding 96 woody studs to the outside of the track. Now, there's already 96 old studs on the inside, or at least there was at one time because there's about 10 or so broken off. Now adding these additional studs should develop a bit more grip on the ice with two more lines of studs going down. Every other old triple sled we ran had huge issues with traction the whole way down the run, so the only way to improve traction on the ice is with more studs. So there's no shortcut or trick to this job, although 96 studs on the outside of the track does go pretty easy, however, it's still a drill, assemble, tighten, repeat type of process. For me though, I like to drill and assemble first, then get in the groove of tightening up all the studs in one go. But there's no wrong way to do this job and you can do it any way you like. 
Now I may have mentioned that there's no trick to doing this job, but I lied to you, there actually is one. And it's this tool right here that holds an Allen key that holds the head of the stud in place when you're tightening them up. This is an absolute finger saver to do this job. I highly recommend it. When it comes to traction, there's no substitute for studs. Not only is acceleration and top speeds improved, but so is braking. Now, when it comes to snowmobile performance, all that power can go to waste if you can't get it to the ice. But even if your riding style isn't all about performance, studs can still improve safety and stability when you encounter an unexpected icy patch. With 96 new Woody studs installed on the track, I'm gonna turn my attention to the clutches, which I've already got here on the bench. Now, before the last radar run, I did take them apart, clean them up, and scuffed up the sheaves, that type of thing. But when I was in there, I did notice a number of things that were starting to get worn out. So, with the time off, I was able to order some new parts, and we're gonna install those right away. Snowmobile clutches are a bit of a mystery to a lot of riders, and for good reason. There is a lot going on in here, and each clutch needs to be working together for performance. That said, they do wear out over time, and if you want to do any performance tuning at all, you will be fighting against a worn-out system if it's not right. For the few short runs I got out of the sled before the track failure, I found the max RPMs were all over the place, a pretty good indicator that there is a problem. Clutch servicing usually takes some specialty tools to get it done, so this job might be beyond most amateur mechanics. But if you want to invest in a few tools, I'm going to mention YouTube again as a great resource where you can follow a clutch service tutorial from the beginning to end for just about every type of system out there. For the SCSI, all the bits in here are stock, but the ramp shoes on the secondary and the bushings on the primary are completely shot. So if I have any hope for these clutches to shift out to a big speed number, I've got to do this job. Now I ran through this work pretty quickly, but like a lot of jobs so far on the SCSI, they can all be done by just about anybody reasonably competent turning wrenches and maybe with just a few specialty tools. So if you think you're up to stuff like this, I suggest going for it. After all, it's just nuts and bolts. Just remember to take your time, take pictures if you need to, and keep your parts in order as best you can. And at the end of the day, all the work we're doing to the SCSI is just nuts and bolts. With the clutches done, the next job on the SCSI is the installation of the new reeds. Now, I'm putting a lot of faith in these things because it's the reeds that's going to push me past the 107 mile an hour mark set by that all stock XCR. Never installed these things before, so I'm looking forward to this job. The reeds are a direct replacement for the stock ones, but flow much more air because of the double tiered design and lightweight carbon fiber pedals. With an engine, essentially being an air pump, the more efficient it is at moving air means it can make more power. Now we'll see on the ice, but I'm hoping these are a big part of the recipe to speed. I just wish I had a number on the ice last time as a baseline to go from for speed, because with all these new parts going on the SCSI, if it at least doesn't run numbers similar to Rich's XCR and Don's TCAT, it must have been a real turd before. With the new reeds, the rebuilt clutches, all those woody studs installed on that ratty old track, all put together on this Crap Can Mach Z, you can definitely say we're smearing a whole bunch of lipstick on this pig. But before we go to the lake, there's one more job I gotta do. Go fast stickers. These things, it's an easy two mile an hour extra on the top end. That XCR is going down. This portion of STV is brought to you by Woody's. We put the traction in action. So the moment of truth is finally here. Last time on the ice, we had the whole gang of triples out. This time, it's just the SCSI with one goal in mind. This has got to run faster than 107 miles an hour. We got about 45 minutes before that sun goes down. So we're going to film each and every pass that the SCSI makes. But honestly, I'm not sure if this thing is going to hold together mechanically. 
and hopefully by the time the sun does go down, this thing has finally beaten that XCR. Honestly though, <laughs> I have no idea what's gonna happen next. Which I think it did back at the shop, so. Like you just popped it now? I think it was, when it got here they were dead. I was hoping it would come back alive, but it didn't. Well, it's back to the drawing board, as they say. 101 miles an hour out of the scuzz here isn't too bad, but it sure isn't 107 miles an hour, which was my goal. You know, thinking about it, maybe I should put a new drive belt on it or new piston rings or, you know, maybe change the track because that used one I put on is already shedding studs out of it. But you know what? Working on the scuzz here has been an absolute blast and brought back a lot of good memories. So I think I'll probably bring it back to the shop throw more parts at it, and try again for that elusive 107 mile an hour number. Why? Just because. Closed captioning is brought to you by Best Western Hotels and Resorts. So Rich, we finally had a chance to put both an 850 matrix and a 650 matrix on the snow together here kind of in our own backyard. We're riding out of Pembroke, Ontario, and uh, we're gonna compare the two machines the 850 and 650, but talk to me a little bit about some of the initial ride impressions of the Matrix chassis itself, because this is really the first time we've had a chance to, to put some serious miles on it in one day. So talk to me about what you found riding that thing. What I found about the Matrix chassis was it was more planted than the Axis. The Axis chassis for me with an 850 seemed a lot more alive on the trail. When you're going at some good speeds, yeah. like it seemed to have a, not a mind of its own, but it seemed to be a little more flighty. Where the Matrix was much more planted, it was easier to control on the trails, and I think that it'll make any rider a better rider on this platform than an Axis. And you mentioned something too, because we did have a chance to jump on you know, one machine to the other, both of us back and forth a number of times through the day. You also found a little bit of a difference in the ride quality or the riding feel between the 650 and the 850. So why don't you talk a little bit about that? You know that. that's a 650. It felt good, it felt light, but the 850 seemed to have a little more jam everywhere and obviously top end. But you also talked about the 650 being a little bit more forgiving on the trail, just something that you can kind of get in and get into a real rhythm with the 650 that was, with, with the more power from the 850 was a little bit harder to control. Again, the 650 was very friendly to ride almost. Yeah, it was very friendly. It was probably an easier ride and yeah. for a, 
a novice to a beginner rider, the 650 is right at home. But if you're if you're going for it all day long and you're a very experienced rider and you like to go a little bit faster, the 850 all day long. Yeah, I, I kind of agree. The 850, I mean, obviously it's got 200 more cc, so it is going to be more powerful. And it is quite, you notice that kind of everywhere in the ride experience that the 850 just has more jam to it. There is a major difference between the 650 and 850, so you really have to know how you're riding and where you're riding. The 850 for me is, that's my, that's where I am. I agree. I, I enjoy the 850 a lot more than the 650 just because, you know, I like having that feeling of power and I, I'm, I feel I'm skilled enough as a rider to kind of deal with that. And yep. when you, you pull the trigger to, you know, control that animal that is underneath there. Now, again, we talked a little bit about, you know, how the, the 850 and 650 rode different on the trails. Um, and yeah, we did say that the 850 has more power everywhere. Mm -hmm. Obviously it's got 200 cc more engine to it. But I do want to say that the 650, I spent probably more time on the 650 yesterday than I did the 850. At no time was I really feeling I needed more power if you're just wanting a great trail ride. Very good snowmobile. This, you're not leaving a whole lot on the table to only have a launch edition. If you've got a 650 launch edition matrix, it is an awesome ride. That's better, we know that, but it's, it's still, this is still a very good snowmobile. It's a fantastic snowmobile. Now, that's about it for this show, um, but you're probably wondering, what are the differences between these two motors on top speed, on acceleration in comparisons? Well, we're gonna do that on the next Snowmobile or Television, so make sure you come back and watch that one. Until then, keep your skis between the trees. STV is brought to you by CKX, wear your passion. Schaefer's, specialized lubricants since 1839. Best Western Hotels and Resorts. Ready to get away? 